Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining CBIA's webinar today, Lose-Lose Scenario, U.S. Export Controls and Immigration Law. I'm Diane McCriskey, CBIA's Employment Counsel. So today we're joined by Shipman and Goodwin's Alfredo Fernandez and Bradley Harper. Attorney Fernandez is a partner at Shipman and Goodwin. He leads the firm's manufacturing industry team. He's a former aerospace engineer and mainly practices in the areas of international trade and environmental law. He's also a brand new member of CONSTEP's board of directors. CONSTEP is a CBIA affiliate organization which offers manufacturing consulting services. Attorney Harper is joining him today. He's an associate with the firm uh, with the immigration and employment practices. He helps employers and individuals navigate the U.S. immigration system, including employment matters, discrimination, and retaliation claims. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alfredo and Bradley. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Diane, and, and thank you to CBIA for um, collaborating with us on, on this uh, timely topic. Uh, since it's been advertised, we've had a few clients and connections actually reach out uh, directly with some excitement on the topic, so we know we're uh, hitting on, on something that that folks uh, in the area are are thinking about or weren't thinking about, but realize they need to be thinking about. Uh, so Bradley, go ahead on our next slide. Sure. We're going to start with a little bit of the news and then um, broaden up a little bit. We'll talk about some of the export compliance considerations, some of the immigration issues, uh, and, and, and kind of the nexus of, of this uh, presentation is where some of those issues seem to conflict with one another, hence our, our title lose-lose scenario, because uh, sometimes uh, at the expense of one, you have to take care of business on the other area of law. And we'll get into a little bit of the specifics in a couple of slides after we present some of our very recent case studies. Uh, it, with the case of General Motors, the Department of Justice had investigated uh, the company and uh, realized they had asked for uh, extra documentation from some of their um, employees and candidates during the onboarding process as part of their uh, conditions of employment. They had been uh, going through the work authorization step that Bradley will explain as, as the I-9 process and collecting uh, documentation to confirm they're authorized to work in the United States during onboarding, but they were using, they got tempted to use that same process to kind of figure out what kind of export control issues might we have with this particular foreign candidate coming on board. Um, the blurring of those two processes, the I-9 work authorization and, and export controls and internal compliance steps um, ran afoul of, of the anti-discrimination provisions uh, of a law you know, we'll discuss called the INA. The DOJ is pretty active in pursuing that blurring and, and those kind of anti-discriminatory uh, violations, uh, hence the need for um, for this topic and and the discussion on it, because it is uh, getting looked at by, by DOJ pretty regularly. In this case, GM had to pay a pretty large fee here, $365,000. Uh, but beyond just the penalty, which for GM, you know, it is a sting, but it's not a you know a company breaker. Uh, they have other remedial non-financial measures, including um, you know, required policy updates, internal training, new reporting, and monitoring. Uh, so, so some of the non-financial steps of their settlement here uh, might actually be more of a pain point uh, for GM in, in this case. Next. Somewhat similar story, little bit different facts, smaller company uh, called American Cyber Systems, Inc. It now goes by Innova Solutions. Uh, and in this case, uh, DOJ, under the same law, found the violation of those anti-discriminatory uh, provisions, uh, but in a different way. In this case, ACS had been posting for job positions and, and flat out saying only U.S. citizens or, or green card holders, legal permanent residents, can apply. And they were doing that because the job required access to export controlled technical information. And they wanted to weed out uh, it, whether, you know, intentionally discriminatory or not doesn't really matter. They used that posting and the language to weed out potential candidates that would require extra scrutiny from an export compliance and licensing perspective. That is uh, pretty clear cut 
a violation of uh, of the DO um, the DOJ's uh, prerogatives under the the INA, and uh, turned out to be a violation. Curiously, they had a very different uh, job posting with kind of the opposite effect, where they were applying or posted a job exclusively available to those with temporary work visas, essentially excluding U.S. citizens from even applying. Uh, so while it was hurting a, a different demographic, still uh, ended up being a, a discrimination based on, on citizenship uh, status or immigration status. In this case, the penalties were comparable to the GM uh, result. The numbers were, uh, of course, smaller for, for ACS. I don't have the exact penalty number, just given the size difference of the companies, but similar required monitoring, uh, record keeping, uh, and you're on, you know, this company is now on DOJ's radar uh, for, you know, potential uh, immigration and, and um, citizenship discrimination issues. So uh, even though that there is a financial piece, there's also a non-financial piece with these settlements uh, that can sting for, for some years to come. Next. So companies are, are faced, and, and this is our conundrum here, they're faced with making sure they're not inadvertently bringing on foreign folks that would have access to sensitive technology controlled by export uh, requirements. And they're also looking to not have to not discriminate here. So a policy to, to, to phase out or screen out some of these foreign candidates from these job openings seems like it would make sense from an export compliance perspective. As we just showed you, though, GM, AC, IACS, um, and others have... Um, can, can tell you firsthand experience with their settlements uh, that policies that are too harsh on who they're screening uh, can can end up violating federal anti-discrimination laws, even if you're dealing with you know ITAR specific uh, type rules. And we'll get into you know what some of these acronyms like INA and ITAR actually mean. Apologies for using uh, too many acronyms before we've introduced them. Uh, this leads us to what we call the compliance conundrum. It leaves companies between a rock and a hard place. Uh, and my sheep here is my favorite slide on, on the deck uh, because it's cute, but the uh, the issue is not cute. The uh, companies are, are kind of in this tight spot. I need to avoid discriminating against my potential candidates, but I can't just let anybody in because I have ITAR or EAR or other export type uh, requirements uh, that I can't violate uh, in terms of the data they would have access to as, as one of my employees. So just by transitioning here as a bit of a quick primer on, on some of the export laws and regulations, presuming a, there's at least some familiarity here without getting into uh, necessarily the, the full 101 overview, there are two general uh, sets of regulations that control exports in the United States. There's the Export Administration Regulations or the EAR. Uh, these are controlled by the Department of, um, oh, I think I, I got some information switched here. Uh, the EAR, the ITAR should be the first one there. I think in editing, we just took, uh, did that. Uh, so switch your logos and your blue text. The ITAR is the one that controls the military items and tech. Uh, and that one's controlled by the Department of State. We'll fix the slides before we send them out. Uh, and the EAR is the one that controls the, the dual use goods and technology. Uh, and in recent years, the EAR has actually grown to include some military, less sensitive military information. But in terms of volume, most of the stuff goes out under the EAR uh, and, and is under EAR jurisdiction, and that's managed by the Department of Commerce, specifically the Bureau of Industry and Security. Next. Getting export compliance wrong is costly. Uh, we see it. It's been a very active uh, enforcement phase in the last 18 months or so with very significant export compliance um, requirements with the Russia-Ukraine thing has added a unique way of, of export control uh, considerations as well. Um, so getting it wrong is can, can really hurt uh, a company, small, medium, or large. Uh, it can involve multiple federal agencies. That, like I mentioned, the, the uh, Department of Commerce, Department of State, DOJ could actually be involved as well on the criminal side, Homeland Security, et cetera. It can, it can um, expand quite a bit. For, for some of the minor issues, you know, it, the penalty figures can be in the five figures or with some self-disclosure uh, mitigation can actually you know come down even less, sometimes even zero, if it is kind of more minor paperwork mistake type stuff. Uh, but if it is more serious, more intentional, 
uh, broader scale happened over the years and, and these violations keep um, snowballing on each other uh, because a lot of the, the penalties are per violation. Uh, we've seen penalties in the in the multi millions for some of the more serious, uh, both on civil civil and criminal um, issues. In addition, if there is knowing and willful violations of export laws, imprisonment is on the table. We do see some jail time associated with violations of export controls, but those are really reserved to to bad actors knowing that they're acting bad uh, and trying to circumvent the law. As we mentioned, a lot of agencies in play. One I'll mention here that I haven't yet is the uh, Department of Treasury or the OFAC Office of Foreign Asset Controls that handles economic sanctions. It's not directly on point with uh, with our presentation today, but sanctions and, and export controls are, are often uh, linked at the hip. Next. One of the important concepts we need to uh, drive home for, for the rest of this discussion is, is what an export actually is. And it can be a lot of things. It can be a physical item sent off to a foreign destination. You might be thinking planes, trains, and boats like our photo here. Something is going in a box or a shipping container and going to a different country, right? Uh, but it, that is, is, of course, an export. But it can be much more than that. Some of the regulated items can be software, technology, drawings, know-how. Uh, and, and they can happen in a variety of ways that a lot of folks, until they've heard this uh, concept of of a deemed export, kind of this intangible export concept, don't realize it could be happening. It could be a phone conversation, a face-to-face -face conversation, a tour, uh, an exchange of, of paper, uh, leaving the country with your computer, which has uh, the technical information inside. It could be a lot of our Zooms and shared screen type meetings these days, uh, or, or posting on an internet or intranet, uh, depending on, on who has access to that site. Each of those can be considered an export. Next. So in terms of figuring out when something like that happens, who's the recipient? Because the recipient is often a, um, a very important factor to determine licensing and authorization for that person. If it's going to a U.S. person in, U, in, in U.S. property, uh, that's not an export because it really hasn't left. And U.S. persons are citizens, legal permanent residents, or green card holders. It also includes asylees and refugees, or those who have qualified for asylum or refugee status through the immigration laws and processes. Um, it includes U.S. businesses and, and branch offices of U.S. corporations, even um, outside of the United States. Um, the foreign person is any natural person that doesn't really qualify as a U.S. person or any foreign business that doesn't qualify as a U.S. business. And as a matter of speaking, a lot of exports or some exports that go to foreign persons, whether they're individuals or companies, may require export authorization. There are plenty, of course, that don't, and a lot of the EAR 99 type classifications that you might be familiar with can go out to a lot of countries without licensing, but that, that's a step that should be checked uh, before that export actually happens. Next. So we'll, we'll get into this concept of a deemed export because it is relevant for purposes of, of this, you know, these, these DOJ enforcement cases. And a deemed export is a release of, of technical data or technology to a foreign national uh, in the United States. So even if a lot of our folks here are from, from Connecticut today, so a conversation that happens in Connecticut with between a U.S. person and a foreign national would be deemed to be an export to their home country, right? Even if we're all, you're standing in the same room in the United States and Connecticut or whatever state you happen to find yourself, uh, that can be an export depending on the nature, the technical nature of that conversation. A license, uh, go ahead, Bradley, next slide. And a license for those deemed exports would be required if a license for a physical export of that same thing to that same country uh, would have been uh, required as well. Now, the, the regs have some, some relevant definitions that inform this deemed export concept, and they're very similar in some ways by design. In recent years, the Department of Commerce and Department of State have been intentional about streamlining their definitions to be as close to one another as possible. There's some defined terms uh, in each respective regulations that aren't you know, perfect matches like it's called technical data on the ITAR with, you know, based on its definition and the EAR refers to uh, technology, but effectively and conceptually they're, they're dealing with, with very similar uh, 
things. What, what each of those regulations uh, consider an export is a release or an otherwise uh, kind of a transfer of technology or technical data from a foreign person to the United States. So both regulations are aligned. And this release term we'll get into uh, shortly here. In terms of, I'll go, uh, go back just one second here, Brad, thanks. Uh, the, on the bottom row here, where there is a difference between the EAR and the ITAR in terms of figuring out who is the recipient. And we, you know, we, we talked about foreign person recipients, understanding who counts as a recipient or which countries count as a recipient in a deemed export scenario is relevant. On the ITAR side, it's broader. They include any country which in which that person has citizenship or permanent residency. Uh, on the EAR side, it's a little narrower. It's only that person's current uh, citizenship and residency uh, or permanent residency um, country. So EAR provides a little more flexibility. ITAR requires a little more digging that in certain cases uh, that can be potentially problematic on the onboarding process. And then another similarity here, the, the concept of release uh, for purposes of an export uh, matters because if there is no release, there is no export, which you know, we've relied on in certain cases um, where, where the question has come up. Here, that release amounts to visual or, or other kind of inspection uh, by the person that reveals the technical data or, um, or the technology to that foreign person. And it can also include an oral or written exchange uh, with the foreign person in the United States or abroad. So if you're, you know, for one of the examples they use, if you're giving a tour and you, you just blaze through, you know, a factory line without stopping and without any foreign person really having any material way to inspect visually or, or otherwise, you know, an ITAR product that may be on a machine, you got a pretty good argument that there really wasn't a release of, of ITAR or EAR controlled data in that case because it was so fast. Nobody really had any way to scientifically uh, capture that type of um, release of, of, the, um, of technical data or technology. And in many, you know, in our experience, many of our manufacturing clients don't have a very clean delineated facility between ITAR products or EAR products, they have one machine that has to work on whatever part. It's not like they have the same machine for on the ITAR side of the factory and, and the same for the EAR side of the factory. Um, that's just not a reality for most um, companies we, we've been dealing with uh, on some of these issues. So, um, yeah, they're just dividing it all together in, in a factory is just not a practical way. Uh, but some of the questions are, if somebody has to walk through the facility, what am I looking at in terms of of what's actually being released. And of course, some of that's fact specific. Next slide. So as, as we wrap up the, the export portion of, of this presentation, uh, it is important from a compliance perspective for the employers or the companies here to determine, is an export license uh, going to be required to before deemed exports actually happen when I'm bringing on a foreign person? That comes down to really four factors. Uh, and before I get into those four factors, a non-U.S. person, for the most part, we're talking about employees here today, but it could also be a, a contractor that's brought in for a, a temporary project. It could be a student intern that's here for a couple months. It could be a visitor to the facility, potentially a, like a potential vendor or a potential partner uh, or just a member of the community, et cetera. Um, it could be, it does, you don't necessarily have to have a contract. Uh, with the person you're doing uh, to have a deemed export at the facility. Uh, in terms of determining what is the licensing requirement for this particular deemed export class that might happen by, by hiring this person, you, you'd have to be looking at the classification of your product or your service or your technology. Uh, is it ITAR? Is it EAR? And under any of those, do you understand your classification numbers for each of those? Because it can... Um, it can play a factor in whether a license is actually required. Um, understanding the destination. Here, in this case, nothing's actually going into a box and going anywhere. You need to look at, at that individual's uh, you know, personal information to figure out what is my destination from an export compliance perspective and a kind of a, a compliance uh, 
preventing an unauthorized export uh, step, right? As, as we mentioned, ITAR and EAR are not perfectly aligned in what that means, uh, but the country of citizenship or, or residency uh, is, is very relevant. Understanding the end user, uh, of course, this would probably happen with any kind of onboarding background check and things like that, uh, where you want to make sure your end user is not going, uh, is not on a on one of the prohibited party lists maintained by the OFAC um, agency that I mentioned, or BIS and, and the State Department maintain their own uh, similar list, and understanding the end use of, of a product as well, or technology in this case, uh, making sure you know, the receipt and the release of that information uh, is all above board in line with U.S. interests, uh, because if it's not, a, a license would be required kind of regardless of the, uh, of the above. Uh, types of categories. If a license is required, and, and that may be the case, and we support clients through this all the time, employers have to apply to the relevant agency. Sometimes it's the Department of State for an ITAR license. Sometimes it's the Department of Commerce for an EAR license. Sometimes it's both because the employee would have access to both. Um, and that's a step that would have to happen uh, before releases of those technologies uh, go to that non-U.S. person. As Bradley will explain, that doesn't mean you can't hire them find other work for them to do, um, or wall off certain types of technology uh, physically or electronically. Uh, but uh, it, this is where we meet a little bit of the tension between making sure you're not allowing inadvertent exports without authorization versus not discriminating against you know, potential candidates and existing employees. So with that, I think, Bradley, you'll take over. Is that right? That's right. All right. Thank you. So Alfredo's kind of walked us through the export control laws that the employers in the two cases we spoke about, GM and ACS, were dealing with. And as you probably picked up on, a lot of those export compliance laws, they involve concepts of non-US persons, of their country of origin, their destiny, you know, where's the destination, you know, where's the information going? So it really involves people's citizenship status, their national origin. Um, and their U.S. work authorization. So the, the DOJ was looking at applying the Immigration and Nationality Act's anti-discrimination provisions when they came down on GM and ACS. A lot of folks, when they hear the Immigration and Nationality Act or the INA, they think, oh, that doesn't apply to me, that there's just a set of rules that sets forth the way that people immigrate to the United States or become naturalized U.S. citizens. And that is true. Uh, the large chunk of the INA does deal with those sort of immigration benefits. However, it actually applies to all of us on the call. Um, it covers every person that's in the U.S. It has anti-discrimination provisions, and different provisions apply to you depending on the nature of your citizenship and national origin. So first, what does the INA prohibit? So the INA prohibits discrimination with respect to hiring, firing, and recruitment and referral for a fee on the basis of national origin, citizenship, or immigration status. It also prohibits unfair documentary practices in terms of verifying someone's employment eligibility based on their national origin, citizenship, and immigration status. And it also prohibits intimidating and retaliating against people for attempting to file a complaint, testify, or essentially protect their rights under the INA. So who does the INA protect? So again, everybody on this call is probably protected by the INA in some form or fashion, right? The amount of protection we have will vary depending on our citizenship. So the INA protects US citizens, US nationals, lawful permanent residents, which is another word for green card holders, asylees and refugees from being discriminated against on the basis of their citizenship and their immigration status. But even people that have no U.S. immigration status whatsoever have some protection under the INA, and that it also protects all individuals who are authorized to work in the U.S. from national origin discrimination, document abuse, and retaliation for trying to protect their rights under the INA. So, the INA doesn't always apply in every case. So for very small employers, folks that have three or fewer employees, the INA doesn't apply to you. That doesn't mean it's a discrimination free for all, however, because 
there are also other rights that other acts that protect folks from discrimination, including the Civil Rights Act from 1964. And if a particular discriminatory act is covered under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, then the INA doesn't apply. And without getting too deep into the weeds, that would cover things such as race discrimination, gender discrimination, right? In addition, um, the INA doesn't apply where the discrimination based on citizenship occurs in order to comply with other legal requirements. And examples of those other legal requirements are where an employer discriminates on the basis of citizenship because they're a federal contractor and their contract with the federal government does requires everyone on the contract to be a US citizen. Or if the attorney general has issued an order that requires certain positions to only be held by US citizens. Yeah, Bradley, let me jump in here and clarify that the DOJ and um, and I believe the Department of State have explicitly said export compliance under kind of a regular manufacturer type um, or exporter status is not this, uh, this third bullet. It's not a legal requirement to have only U.S. persons or, or you know, uh, for, for ITAR registered companies. Uh, so some folks were, were leaning on that as, as the way to do the screening. Uh, it's been clarified pretty clearly. Don't try to use this uh, legal requirements hook for, for kind of your basic exporting manufacturer as the reason. Right, we'll get a little bit deeper into that one, but you're, that should be a key takeaway today. The export compliance control laws do not require employers to limit the folks they hire to U.S. citizens. You can't have behind that. That's not what the law says. So don't don't take away that third bullet in that regard. We'll get more into what the ITAR laws actually require. Um, and finally, the INA doesn't apply where a, a person or an entity prefers to hire a U.S. citizen or U.S. national over a foreign national if two people apply and the U.S. citizen is at least equally qualified to the foreign national. It, it's A-OK -okay to prefer hiring a foreign or a U.S. worker in that case. So what happens if you don't comply with the INA? Well, as we saw, GM and ACS can tell you it can cost money and it can cause a lot of headaches. So a court can issue a cease and desist order and that cease and desist order can require several, all or, or none of the things that we're going to talk about. If an individual was discriminated against in terms of they weren't hired for a job or they were let go for a job on the basis of their national origin, citizenship status, then the employer can be required to hire that person back or reinstate them and may be required to pay them back pay for the time that they were out of work. An employer may be required to post notices on all of their work sites that um, alert employees to their rights and the employer's obligations under the INA. And an employer may be required to take on an education and retraining program for all of their recruiting staff, onboarding staff, hiring managers about proper procedures for verifying an individual's eligibility to work in the U.S. while also complying with anti-discrimination laws. And in terms of money, a court can not only level civil and penalties that can add up to thousands, tens of thousands of dollars for each victim, but they can also make the employer pay the attorney's fees to the prevailing party. So keeping this in mind that employers may have to comply with export compliance laws, but everyone has to follow the INA's anti-discrimination provision, what are employers who are subject to export compliance laws supposed to do to make sure that they balance their obligations under both of those laws? So with these recent cases from GM and from ACS, the Department of Justice has given employers some helpful guidance. They've actually issued guidance several times throughout the years. It, it's been pretty consistent throughout the years, but the latest guidance in the form of an employer fact sheet is actually pretty straightforward. Um, so there's a form and we've got it linked here. We'll be sharing the slide so you can download this handout um, if you wanna keep it on your desk or share it with your hiring team. Um, but the DOJ, you know, they, they have a bullet point fact sheet that walks through ways that employers can comply with both their obligations under export compliance laws and with the INA. So what are some of the takeaways from the Department of Justice? So the first option is kind of a, a keep it simple option, right? Just meet in the middle. So it's important, Alfredo touched on this when we were talking about why the INA does not prohibit 
But again, uh, sorry, what the export control laws do not prohibit. The US export control laws don't limit the categories of work authorized people that employers can hire, meaning they don't limit employers who are subject to export control compliance laws to only hiring US persons or US citizens. That's because if a US employer hires someone who's not a US person, there's a mechanism for them to apply for an export license if that person's position is going to require them to have access to information, materials, technology that will be subject to export compliance laws. On the other hand, the INA, for all of its protections against discrimination, it doesn't require an employer to hire someone who doesn't have authorization to work in the U.S., so if you kind of put these two laws side by side, there's actually kind of a happy place in the middle. This means if you look at the INA that doesn't require anybody, any US employer to hire someone who doesn't have authorization to work in the US um, and the export compliance control laws allow folks who do not have US work authorization to apply for a license that would allow them to have access to information that protected by export control laws. In the middle there, an employer could satisfy their obligations under both laws if they just took a hard line stance and said, as a company policy, we're not going to provide any kind of immigration sponsorship or work authorization sponsorship to folks that don't have it, right? By doing so, you wouldn't be running afoul of export compliance laws because you're not going to have non-U.S. persons working at your facility. And from an INA perspective, you're not running afoul of any anti-discrimination laws because you're not required to provide someone with authorization or immigration sponsorship to work in the U.S. Keeping in mind that this approach is not going to work for everyone because the world is full of, of foreign nationals and in, in America, it may not be possible to totally staff your operations with just natural born Americans. You may need to expand the pool of applicants from which you recruit. That leaves option two, right? So here we need to look to the federal government for guidance. Again, the conundrums that we talked about, you know, when the U.S. employer becomes that little sheep in between the rock and the hard place is when they're trying to comply with U.S. export compliance laws, but also try to screen out folks that foreign nationals that would make them have to apply for a special license, right? Because employers want to avoid the burden of applying for those export licenses, they often find themselves in this trap of impermissibly screening out applicants who have U.S. work authorization, which is what has them run afoul of the INA. So what can an employer do? So it really gets back to the screening aspect. So it's not that there can't be any screening in the process of hiring, recruiting, and filling jobs where export compliance laws are going to come into play. It's how you do the screening that counts. So the Department of Justice has given a, a useful tidbit in terms of a question that employers can use when screening applicants that will not be considered to run afoul of the INA's anti-discrimination provisions. So what you need to keep in mind if you're going to take the second approach and screen job applicants to figure out if you're going to need to apply for export control license is to focus on their need for immigration sponsorship, right? Their need to be sponsored in order to have authorization to work in the U.S. Instead of focusing on someone's immigration status, their citizenship status, or their national origin, the country they come from. So the question that the Department of Justice has given the green light to said that employers can include on job applications or ask in the hiring process is, will you now or in the future require visa sponsorship in order to work for our company in the U.S., right? So if an applicant answers yes to this question, it tells employers some things about them that allows them to use that information to figure out you know, what do they need to do, right? Are they going to be subject to protections under the INA? If a person says yes, that they either now or in the future are going to require visa sponsorship in order to work for your company, then one thing that that tells you is this person is not going to be considered a U.S. person under the ITAR or EAR, because remember, U.S. persons are U.S. citizens and nationals, U.S. lawful permanent residents, asylees, and refugees. 
all of those folks have U.S. work authorization, so they would not need to answer yes to this question. Anyone that answers yes to this question is not going to be a U.S. person under ITAR or EAR. So that tells you one thing about your export compliance obligations. But secondly, if someone answers yes to this question, then they clearly don't have U.S. work authorization. So that also tells you that in terms of your INA anti-discrimination obligations, you know that you don't have to worry about um, this person in terms of making discrimination or making a decision on the basis of their citizenship or their immigration status. They're not protected in that regards. So employers who pose this question and receive an answer of yes can lawfully reject that applicant if the company's taken the stance that their policy is not to provide immigration sponsorship. So if an applicant answers yes to this question, and then the employer begins the process of sponsoring that person for US work authorization, you know, this employer doesn't have a policy of not authoring sponsorship, but then that employer later decides to rescind the job offer or to fire that foreign national because they learn of that person's country of origin, then that employer has likely run afoul of the INA's anti-discrimination provisions. Now, when this might come up is because, as Alfredo touched on, the, the destination to which information, materials are being released, would be, in some cases, not only the country that the person is, is a citizen of or a country where they're permanent resident, it could also be countries where they have lived or have been um, a citizen. And employers sometimes who are dealing with export compliance issues all the time will come to know, okay, if this person's from, you know, if I have someone from Saudi Arabia, while well, I can apply for a license for them, I know that it's not going to be granted. Or, you know, if they're from China, it's going to be very difficult to get the license. But the problem would then, after you've already agreed to sponsor someone from those countries for the U.S. work authorization to work for you, but then decide based on their national origin not to give them the job, is you are discriminating against them on the basis of where they're from, right? The fact of the matter is it, it's difficult for them to perhaps get that license or maybe impossible, but the reason why you're rescinding the offer or terminating them is an impermissible reason. It's based on their country of origin. So the main takeaway here when screening is just focus on the person's work authorization, their need for immigration sponsorship. Don't get into questions about their citizenship status or their national origin when you're in the application or the hiring phase. So another thing to keep in mind is the documentary practices that you use as an employer. So again, one thing we discussed with through the lens of the GM case was GM got into trouble because they were impermissibly trying to combine processes in order to both establish someone's U.S. work authorization, but also to figure out whether that person was going to be a non-U.S. person under U.S. export control laws. So there's really two processes that an employer is going through when they're faced with that. And so they should follow two separate formal processes to get to the answers they need. The one process that every U.S. employer should be familiar with, because all U.S. employers have to go through it, is the I-9 process, right? So the I-9 process serves for one function and one function only, to establish that someone has authorization to work for you in the U.S., the way it works is the employee is given a Form I-9. On page three of the, at least the current version of the Form I-9, there's a list of documents that the person can pick from. It's like a menu. They can pick one document on there or a combination of documents, that, and it'll satisfy their ability to show that they have U.S. work authorization. Employees get to make the choice of what documents they're going to pick off of that menu or list and employers have to accept them as long as the, the document or combination of documents is actually on the menu. However, with export compliance assessments, that serves a different purpose. That doesn't have anything to do with whether a person is authorized to work in the US. The purpose of an export compliance assessment is to figure out, can this person have access to certain information, materials, you know, technology while they're working in the U.S. So employers here need to ask for specific documents and the documents that a person presents during the I-9 process to establish that they have U.S. work authorization 
may not at all be helpful for an employer who's trying to per perform an assessment of that person's need for an export license. So with the export compliance assessment, an employer can ask employees for specific documents because they need to establish that person's citizenship and immigration status. They're not establishing their US work authorization. When an employer is going through an export compliance assessment, they should also make it clear to the employee that the term, they're trying to determine if they're a U.S. person, and the term U.S. persons covers more than just U.S. citizens. And perhaps most importantly, the employer needs to make it clear to the employee that the purpose of the export compliance assessment is to determine if that employee needs special authorization in order to access materials that are deemed exports or covered by the export control laws. It is not being performed in order to determine if they're authorized to work in the US. So another thing to keep in mind is, you know, how you store documents when you do these two distinct separate processes, right? The i process and the export compliance assessment process. How those documents are stored can also have an impact on whether the Department of Justice will find that you violated the INA's anti-discrimination provisions. Because they're two separate processes, the documents should be stored separately. If you're an employer that stores documents or keeps copies of documents that employees present when they're completing the I-9 process, you should keep the Form I-9s and all of those documents in entirely separate folders from documents that you collect or notes you take during the export compliance assessment process. So to that end, the, the files and documents in your I-9 folder shouldn't have any notes on them about whether the person's going to be subject to export compliance rules. It shouldn't have a note that says need to apply for export control license, right? None of that should be on there. There shouldn't be any type of annotations that have anything to do with that person's citizenship or national origin because it doesn't have anything to do with the I-9 process. And again, our friends over at ACS can tell you that it's not just the hiring and onboarding process that can cause trouble. It's how you even advertise a job, how you recruit for a job. So in the case of ACS, they got into trouble because they were including language in their job openings that either limited it to non-US workers or limited it strictly to US workers. That's, that's gonna run you into trouble to have those kind of limitations in your job hostings. So probably the best rule of thumb that you can take away is don't state in your job applications or have hiring managers tell applicants that because a particular job involves export control regulations, you're, you're only going to hire people with specific citizenship or specific immigration statuses or people that are only from certain countries. That's a no-no. That's not what the law says. So you shouldn't advertise jobs in that way. You shouldn't have your, your recruiting or hiring folks spreading that misinformation. Don't hide behind ITAR or EAR as a limit, a reason to limit who can apply for or can be interviewed for a job. So finally, what are the main takeaways here? So a big takeaway is figure out an appropriate export compliance management program for your organization, right? Do you have jobs that are going to be subject to export compliance laws is a great place to start. If, if nothing in your line of business involves export compliance laws, consider yourself lucky. It, it's made it that much less complicated to be an employer, but I suspect for everyone on the call today, that's not the case. So figure out, do all the positions that you have involve export compliance, in which case you may need to have a policy that applies across the board? Or are there really only certain roles that even involve export compliance so you can have a more tailored approach to how you recruit for those jobs, hire for those jobs, and onboard people into those jobs? Second, talk to your recruiters, your onboarding folks, your HR folks, figure out what they already know about the law and educate them. Um, implement regular trainings to keep them abreast of the law and remind them of their obligations under the law, and consider circulating the takeaways from the DOJ on the, the handout that I mentioned that came out in April. And finally, if you're going to post a job opening for a position that requires export controlled information, meaning you're getting ready to recruit, recruit for that position and fill it, consider talking to counsel, whether that's Alfredo, to me, you know, an employment law attorney, 
to figure out how you're going to adequately screen to figure out whether your candidates have U.S. work authorization and then separately determine whether they will need special export control licenses or dispensation so that you avoid any penalties from the DOJ or any of the other departments that we've discussed. So, and if you do want to contact us because you, you're getting ready to hire someone for one of those jobs that's subject to export compliance laws, here's our contact information. You can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on the Shipman and Goodman website. And now we'll open up the floor if anybody has any questions for us. We appreciate you coming today. Thanks, Bradley. I want to make a point too uh, on your, I think, last substantive slide, if you could head backwards for us. Here on, on the first checkbox here, part of the export compliance management program might include the use of, of what's called technology control plans. And that means some kind of written document that outlines how you are going to prevent unauthorized exports for a particular employee who already hired, uh, you know, there's no requirement to do the export compliance assessment on day one or before or day zero before they actually start, right? If you have enough of a, a control plan uh, for any non-US uh, employee who comes in, you can do that step at any time during their employment, as long as they're in, in a so-called bubble, whether that's electronic data access or physical access or where their office is, et cetera, uh, that would you know, pretty much ensure no uh, unintentional export happens until you figure out um, where it is or until you go about uh, going um, and getting the license, which which can take a little time to prepare and, and step through with the government. And we do that on a pretty regular basis. A lot of our clients know that they're going to need the license, hire folks from an affiliate in a foreign country anyway, is kind of in an expat status. Um, and we'll have a technology control plan for them for two, three months until the licensing uh, comes around. And, and then they have uh, you know much broader leeway in terms of what kind of you know, internal electronic access they have within the company, uh, and then kind of where they can walk uh, from a facility perspective. Even including sometimes this conference room is unavailable to them because they have to cross through you know this work site and there's you know drawings on the wall or whatever for like, you know um, whiteboards and things like that. So uh, some conference rooms, for example, are are completely blocked off until the license uh, kicks in. So things like that, that would be part of a, a compliance management program, uh, but specifically tailored to that that person, where they sit, what they can do uh, based on, on their country or whatever it may be uh, there. So I, I see we got something in the chat and we'll give it a give it a read here. Uh, so we had a question on on how difficult it is to get deemed export licenses. This company in particular has hundreds of ITAR parts um, and, uh, and 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 growing, right? That the catalog could could grow based on customer needs, new designs, et cetera. Uh, in terms of a licensing um, the a licensing approach, if you you know in that kind of scenario, presuming you couldn't really block them off uh, from from ITAR technology or um, or other kind of inspection or release points, as we discussed, um, a license a deemed export license sounds like it would be a reasonable uh, approach to take. Uh, it's I'll put it this way: I've never had a deemed export license rejected. Um, Finally, like sometimes it iterates a little bit. They want to add a little more information here or question a couple uh, points we put, but eventually we get it. Uh, and then that that individual is good to go for the full breadth of ITAR work. And, and we would describe this company supports the F-135, the F-414 program, the F-100 or whatever it may be. Um, and, and, and this is the type of product we make. We're doing cases, we're doing veins, we're doing uh, afterburner case, you know, parts, whatever. Um, and, and those are just happened to be aerospace examples, but uh, given recent work, but um, if you describe the universe of data that they are likely to see or need to see based on their, their job needs, um, explain uh, a, a little bit about their qualifications uh, for this job and et cetera. And we've been able to essentially get a 
an ITAR license that covers anything that would have been under the existing programs. Of, you know, and my examples again, F-135 veins and, and, and blades and whatever. Um, and then it doesn't really matter if you add a new part number um, every week because it's it's in that umbrella of, of scope. So we've got another question here. This kind of verges more on the employment law side. So if we hire a non-U.S. person and keep them in a bubble until the export license is granted, but the export license is not granted, do we have the legal right to terminate them at that point? So this is where it gets tricky, and you definitely should think about picking up the phone and talking to an attorney. So the Department of Justice, they take a strong stance that, that folks should not be fired on the basis of of the export control laws, right? Because they're they're worried about them being fired on the basis of their national origin, and they really want everybody who's got U.S. work authorization to work if they want to work. So it really starts to hinge on a lot of fact-specific questions as to whether it's going to be safe to terminate this person. So one thing you mentioned is the bubble, right? To Alfredo's point, you don't have to apply for an export control license for someone if you can put protocols in place that allow them to perform their job and be walled off from the elements of the job that would require that license, you can employ them. You're not running afoul of any of the export control laws. So I think one thing that would be relevant in this scenario is, well, how successfully was the bubble implemented? How onerous has that bubble been? How long can you sustain that, right? If it was as simple as just, oh, don't go in that conference room or, oh, we'll put an email firewall up. I, I don't know what the bubble would look like, the Department of Justice may not may not deem it okay to fire that person because you've already figured out a workaround to allow them to do their job without running afoul of the law. However, on the other hand, if every single element of that person's job really requires them to have access to materials or information that's all going to be subject to export control laws, you might have a stronger argument there. And my guess is you probably couldn't have even kept the bubble going while you were applying for the license, right? But those are the kind of fact-specific things you would want to look at to figure out, is the reason I'm terminating this person because they can't do their job, because I can't get the license they need for them to do their job, or can they do their job and I just don't want to deal with the bubble that I have to keep up with because they didn't get the license, right? So I wouldn't immediately fire someone just because the license didn't get granted. I'd call an attorney and walk through all the facts to figure out, do I have a defensible position to take that will prevent me from running afoul of the INA? That's right. And, and you know, some there's no one size fits all answer to that. And, you know, one of the things to to consider is is in the posting for the job or, or you know, if you have a written job description, carefully describing the fact that the job will require uh, uh, export authorization for, you know, ITAR controlled parts, not in a way that is discriminatory as to what kind of candidates they can and can't hire the company, but making it clear to that person, this is a, an essential element of my job before I even applied, or it comes, you know, it's described during an interview type of process. Uh, and obviously it's a delicate walk to not get into this squishy area we've just spent 54 minutes on. Uh, but if it's a very fact-based and in a non-discriminatory uh, factual sentence, uh, that could help support a case for termination if if the employee was aware ITAR licensing would re be required, an appropriate technology control plan bubble was implemented, the company in good faith invested the resources to put together a license application and try to get them authorized and the US government for whatever reason whether it's it is their national origin country or something about their history or their passport activity uh based where they where they've been in the last 10 years something feels uncomfortable for the licensing agents and they reject it and it's just an irreconcilable path to get them a license they're not getting one even if they're work authorized etc that's a pretty good case, and I'm not an employment lawyer. And you know, Bradley would kick me under the table if I get too far. Uh, but that you know, you're building a pretty good case that your hands are tied. You can't do your job, uh, and the foreign government isn't giving us the license to let you do the job. Uh, mm -hmm. So what you know, what more can we do? Oh, it's, presuming there's no alternative, uh, got a non-ITAR, non-export compliant type of uh, role that their skill set would would support. So 
it is very fact specific. It is very documentation specific, uh, but there are probably some best practices we could we could think through. Well, thank you for those questions. If uh, you know, we'll hang around for a couple more minutes. But if there are no more questions, we appreciate uh, you tuning in and, and listening. And and uh, Brad, you could put up our our contact info one more time for folks in case they need to jot that down. But we're happy to to field questions offline uh, after this and uh, and help you talk through some of these tricky issues. Hearing and seeing none, I think we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up.